Hey everybody, you are listening to Truth Be Told. Really appreciate everybody listening in. Really excited today to talk to you a little bit about the show Moon Knight, um, as well as idolatry and a supernatural. So a few weeks ago, the season finale of Moon Knight came out, and I thought it was absolutely awesome. For those of you that haven't seen it and you're worried about spoilers, don't worry, I'm not going to have any spoilers here. Uh, But for those of you that haven't seen it and probably won't see it, that's okay too. This is essentially a superhero story about an amateur Egyptologist who's named Stephen Grant, and he has what is called dissociative personality disorder, which gets him kind of mixed up in the spirit world, particularly the Ennead, which is a particular grouping of nine Egyptian deities. Now, of course, Marvel takes some liberties with the mythology. Uh, It doesn't include all of the gods in the original Ennead in the show, and they also kind of embellish certain roles and powers of some of the gods in order to base a plot around them. So, for example, one of the characters that the primary plot line centers around is the goddess Amit, who's supposed to be a judge of people's actions, but ends up being so tired of uh, evil people that before they can even commit sin, she looks into the future and condemns them before the fact. Now, in reality, Amit was viewed as more of a consequence. So she did weigh the souls of those who died, but she ended up eating those who were evil at the end. So she was still kind of a fair goddess in Egyptian mythology, and that shifts in this show, but that's whatever. It's Marvel. They're going to do that. Now, to me, though, the coolest part of the show, aside from the storyline or the aesthetic of Egyptian mythology, which I find really interesting, or the concept of the characters, was how close to reality I actually see this being. Now, this does not mean I believe in a superhero named Moon Knight that flies around as the avatar of the god Khonshu, protecting the travelers of the night. I don't believe this is a show based on true events or anything like that. But there are a few scenes, one in particular, where some of the gods are about the size of the Great Pyramids in Cairo, and they're fighting each other behind a few of the main character people who are fighting on the ground. And you almost get the sense that the physical fight and the spiritual fight are mirrors of each other. But even though you, the viewer, are watching this and are able to see both fights going on, it seems as if the rest of the population where this fight is happening are unaware of the spiritual fight going on. Now, I believe that this scene and this show actually show a better view of what the spirit world is like than what we actually tend to have in our own minds in a Western way of thinking. Often when we think of the spirit world, we think of angels or demons, and it pretty much stops there. Now, some people might think of ghosts, but within the Christian framework, I think it pretty much gets limited to angels and demons. Uh, But I really believe that the picture painted in the Bible is a lot more intricate than that, and we have just limited it over time. So that's basically what we're going to go through today, and we're going to go through this in five sections that are basically five questions that I think you guys might have based on this introduction. Um, One... What about the Bible is at all similar to this scene in Moon Knight? Two, how does the Bible treat the reality of spiritual beings? Three, how does this interact with our understanding of spiritual beings? Like, do we have anything right um, with our limited understanding of angels and demons? Uh, Four, what do scholars have to say on the topic? And then five, what can we conclude from all of this? So that's kind of our our rough outline. Um, If any one of those parts particularly interests you more than another, you can skip ahead, but um, I'm really hoping that this kind of works as a cumulative case to broaden our understanding of the spiritual world. I'm not here to really give you facts about this is exactly how it's laid out, or here's exactly what you should be thinking of when you read some of the accounts of the Bible. It's more just recognizing that we might have dampened the expansiveness of the spiritual world, and then regaining some of that broadness and uh being okay with the fact that we might not understand some of the intricacies that go on in the spirit realm. And if you think about this, it really makes sense because God has created so much diversity here on the earth, whether it's the different species of animals or the different cultures of people or uh, just how different people look and act and our different personalities. Why then in the heavenly realm would he not have created diversity as well? You know, why would it be so limited to just one type of being and then Some of those beings rebelled, and then some of those beings are following him, but it's the same kind of plateau of uh, individuals. That just doesn't really make sense with being consistent with God's creative style. 
And I also think as we go through this, even though it might seem like a topic that's kind of out there, it's something that we inherently know, even if we don't instinctively conclude how we're going to conclude today. And what I mean by this is I'm going to go through some pretty basic scriptures that most people listening are going to know about already. They'll have read through these. They'll have generally understood what was being said or talked about, but then these scriptures aren't often put together to form a clearer picture of the spiritual world. They're just taken as individual truths, but they're not really reconciled with each other. And that's what we're going to do today. All right, so to start off then, what in the world does the Bible have that is at all similar to this scene in Moon Knight, where you have Amit, this 450-foot crocodile goddess, fighting with Khonshu, this 450-foot bird skeleton god? What imagery is there that leads me to think that this is actually a good view of what the spirit world is like. Well, in Daniel 10, we get an image very much like the scene here. And I'm just going to read the whole chapter. And notice, though we would say that the one who came to Daniel was an angel or acted in the role of an angel, that word is never used for him. And then likewise, the way this being that comes to Daniel describes the people he's against or the beings that he's against, he never actually calls them demons. So, Right off the bat, I think we have a closer pairing of this scene from Moon Knight with the reality of the spirit world than we do our own thoughts towards the spirit world. So in Daniel 10, starting in verse 1, it says this, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. The message was true, but the appointed time was long, and he understood the message and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant food, no meat or wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. So this is after the fall of Babylon. Persia's already come in and Cyrus has been ruling there for three years. And maybe there's tumultuous times. Maybe Daniel's uh, upset because his people are still not returning to Jerusalem like he believed would happen. And he's looking forward to that time. But whatever it is, Daniel is mourning and he's praying and he's fasting um, in the kingdom of Persia. Now, verse 4 says, Now on the 24th day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose waist was girded with gold of Uphaz. Now, Uphaz is a region famous for gold craftsmanship. Some say that this might be the same place as Ophir mentioned in the Bible, and some say it might be a place in southern Arabia, but it's also mentioned in Jeremiah 10 verse 9 uh, as a place that produces fine gold works. Uh, verse 6 says, his body was like beryl. And I think this is interesting. Beryl is a pale green, um, kind of translucent gemstone. It can actually be found adorning the being who would become Satan, the accuser, in Ezekiel 28, verse 13. Uh, Maybe this could indicate some sort of similarity in the type of being that we're seeing here. Um, I don't want to jump too far ahead. It can also be found in the breastplate of the high priest, and it is also the eighth gemstone listed in the New Jerusalem. So I don't really have time to go into all of the symbolism present here, and I'd hate to overextend the symbolism into something that it's really not. But it's just interesting how often beryl and other gemstones pop up in relation to spiritual things. Now, continuing on, it says, His face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like torches of fire, his arms and feet like burnished bronze in color, and the sound of his words like the voice of a multitude. Now, many people here say that this might be a pre-incarnation of Christ or a Christophany. Um, It seems to match some of the symbolism seen in various appearances of Christ before he became Christ, as well as after. Um, But I think the similarities are due, at least in part, because spiritual beings are being discussed, and they share certain qualities that can't really be translated into physical descriptions. So I personally don't believe this is a Christophany. I think there are things that make it pretty evident. But think about it. If an animal were to describe a human... Uh, There would be a lot of similarities between pretty much all humans, but it doesn't mean that all humans are exactly the same. Uh, Because we're all human, you know, we already see the similarities between us, we're more aware of the differences. Um, And I think it works vice versa too. If I were to describe like two male lions, I think my descriptions would be pretty similar, uh, despite them being two different unique entities or beings. I think my description of them would be similar because I 
don't really know how to tell lions apart right off the top of my head. And I think that's only elevated for, for descriptions of spiritual beings. And some have stated that some key differences in the physical manifestations of Christ and this being here are things like uh, the bronze of this being's arms and feet are burnished, meaning kind of finished or com a completed work, whereas Christ's are described in a way that kind of makes it seem like they're still in the fire or they're still um, connected to this, this fire or this power. And some kind of see this as this being that appears before Daniel is a created being, and so he's kind of been forged in that fire, whereas Christ himself, God, the creator, is the forge that those things come from. And that's kind of a, a big difference between when some of God's prophets saw Jesus Christ or pre-incarnate Christ versus this being here. Um, some have also pointed out that this face is like lightning and fire, while Christ is often like a burning sun, a lot more elevated in that way. And then most of this being's appendages are shown, whereas much of Christ's body is covered in his appearances. But I think the kicker comes in a few verses to show that this is absolutely not the pre-incarnate Christ that's appearing before Daniel. Some people also speculate that this being might be the angel Gabriel. Um, I'm not completely against this idea, but it is interesting that Daniel recognizes and names Gabriel in chapter 9, just one chapter earlier. But then in chapter 10, when this being appears to him, it doesn't say, oh, and then Gabriel came back to me, or it doesn't really reaffirm that it's him in this appearance. Um, so I, I just think that's a little bit interesting. If it were Gabriel, you would think he would just name him again um, or describe him the first time he sees him rather than now. But that's not really what happened. So I tend to think it's probably not Gabriel, but I'm, I'm not totally against the idea, especially because I think spirit beings can manifest themselves different ways. But anyway, so then continuing on in verse seven, and I, Daniel alone saw the vision for the men who are with me did not see the vision, but a great terror fell upon them so that they fled to hide themselves. Now, this is the first connection I make to this scene from Moon Knight where the, the viewer can see this epic spiritual battle happening. And clearly the human main characters can tell what's happening as well. But the main population of Cairo, where this is happening, is unaware that a spiritual battle is happening. They understand that something is happening. They're definitely fleeing and running. There are explosions and things going on that they don't really understand. A terror fell upon them, quote unquote. But they're unaware that it is a spiritual battle between ancient deities. And I think this kind of reminds me of this section a lot. Um, and so they fled to hide themselves in verse eight says, therefore I was left alone when I saw this great vision and no strength remained in me for my vigor was turned to frailty in me and I retained no strength. Yet I heard the sound of his words. And while I heard the sound of his words, I was in a deep sleep on my face with my face to the ground. Suddenly in verse 10, a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. And he said to me, O Daniel, man, greatly beloved, Understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. While he was still speaking this, this word to me, I stood trembling. So this is clearly an awesome thing that Daniel is seeing, something incredible. Um, I don't think Daniel is falling down to worship, and I think that's another indication that this is not pre-incarnate Jesus Christ or, or God appearing to him but he's falling down because the strength has left him. He's afraid and he doesn't really know what to make of all of this. It says the strength left him. Verse 12 says, then he said to me, do not fear Daniel for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard and I have come because of your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. So this cannot be Christ, because he's waylaid by another spirit being. Period. Christ does not require Michael's help. Christ would not be left alone when he is forever united with the Father. This cannot be Christ. I mean, I think this is the clincher here for me. Can't be Christ. But... How incredible is this? We're being told about a spiritual battle that happened in a similar geopolitical region that Daniel is in that he doesn't really seem to be totally aware of. Even though he can see this being at this time, he's not totally aware of it. 
happening prior to this. This is a fight that lasted for 21 days and required reinforcements. And we're told about princes of regions and Michael being one of the chief princes for God's kind of side of things, meaning there's some sort of hierarchy, at least on God's side, but I think there's definitely hierarchy on the other side as well. This is incredible. And I think we've read this before and we, we understand that it's true, but we haven't really reconciled it into our view of what the spirit world actually looks like. Continuing on, verse 14, Now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision refers to many days yet to come. When he had spoken such words to me, I turned my face toward the ground and became speechless. And suddenly, one having the likeness of the sons of men touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke, saying to him who stood before me, My Lord, because of the vision, my sorrows have overwhelmed me, and I have retained no strength. For how can this servant of my Lord talk with you, my Lord? As for me, no strength remains in me now, nor is any breath left in me. Then again, the one having the likeness of a man touched me and strengthened me. And he said, O man, greatly beloved, fear not. Peace be to you. Be strong. Yes, be strong. So when he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. Then he said, Do you know why I have come to you? And now I must return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I have gone forth, indeed, the prince of Greece will come. Now this is another evidence of a spiritual ruler of Greece specifically, but over a certain territory. And we know that at this point in history, these were kind of the superpowers of the day vying for control. Babylon was out of the picture, but they had been a superpower previously, and they'd been overtaken by Persia. Then after Persia, Greece would come. So once again, this is a mirroring of human events with heavenly events. And I think we miss this sometimes. We can see that, yes, the human events occurred, and yes, clearly things were happening in the spiritual world, but we don't see that this is literally a mirroring of things happening. Something within the spiritual realm affected what happened in the physical realm. Then verse 21 says, But I will tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth. No one upholds me against these except Michael, your prince. Now, scripture of truth seems to be referenced to events already written. Um, so some things are certain because God has promised them. So what is being said here is that Despite Persia um, fighting with Greece coming quickly or there being some sort of conflict in Persia amongst the princes of Persia with God's servants and then Greece following after that, there are none standing in opposition to them except for this being here talking to Daniel as well as Michael. But I don't think this is meant as a point of frustration like, man, nobody's helping us. Why is nobody helping us? But that protection for the Jewish people in the middle of all this turmoil is assured and that only two of them are really needed to assure that these events take place because God is fighting with them. So this is an epic scene that we see. And again, we've read it before. I'm sure we know that it's in the Bible, but have we merged it with our spiritual worldview? Have we taken a look at what we believe about the spiritual realm in light of what the Bible is telling us about the spiritual realm right here? So then this brings up the question, and is our second section, how does the Bible treat the reality of spiritual beings? And I want to cover this because perhaps you're looking at a section like this in Daniel 10, and you're saying, well, that's more of an anomaly, really. That's not how the Bible treats the supernatural. That's not really the picture that we're seeing overall. This is just kind of one event described in an ancient time that might have been seen in a certain way. But that's not really how the Bible uh, portrays the spiritual realm. But if this view of the supernatural is more accurate than the one we have, where there are angels helping us not trip over rocks and then demons that are haunting houses, where else do we find this view, this Daniel 10 view in the Bible? The answer, I think, is that we find it literally everywhere. In Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 13, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Now this to me speaks of a hierarchy in the spiritual realm, kind of like we saw before. 
um, particularly on the side of evil here. But there's not a one size fits all term to use for evil spirits which is why we don't see that presented in the Bible. Here we have principalities, we have powers, rulers of the darkness of this age, spiritual hosts of wickedness. Other sections of the Bible do talk about demons. Others talk about unclean spirits. Daniel calls them princes, and the list goes on and on and on. And to further emphasize this point, in Mark chapter 5, there's a story recounted of Jesus helping a possessed man. And when he asked the name of the unclean spirit possessing this man, they say that they are legion, for they are many. Now, this absolutely speaks to a multitude of unclean spirits, and that's typically how we take it. But could it also not speak to an ordering or a ranking, maybe an organization or a unit? I think based on all of the other scriptures where it seems like there is this hierarchy, I don't see why we shouldn't take this from this section as well. In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul gives us some insight into the practice of idolatry, which I think merges into this concept of the spirit realm. And I think Paul offers us some clarity here as to why idolatry is such a big deal to God, why it so often ensnared ancient Israel, and why it's really important for us to avoid today. In verse 18 of 1 Corinthians 10, Paul says, Observe Israel after the flesh. Are not those who eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What am I saying then, that an idol is anything, or what is offered to idols is anything? Rather, that the things which Gentiles offer sacrifice. They sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Now this section in particular is talking about meat offered to idols um, but these idols were gods of the Greek and Roman pantheon, and Paul calls them demons. Now, what about the Egyptian pantheon, if we want to go back to uh, the show Moon Knight? If Paul is looking at these Greek and Roman gods and saying these are real beings that are being offered sacrifices, we need to treat them as such. Um, what about the other pantheons that exist? Now, we often will stop at... When he says, what am I saying then, that an idol is anything? And we'll say, see, an idol is nothing. It's just a piece of stone. It's an inanimate object. Idol worship is stupid, and the people that practiced it were dumb and ignorant, and just they really didn't understand what was going on. And then we somehow also understand that it is the worship of demons, but we don't connect the two thoughts like Paul does. Paul had a much clearer vision of what the spiritual world looked like. Now, the idol itself is only stone or wood. It's a representation. It has no power of itself, but there is a power behind it. It is an evil being with a personality, with an agenda, with a desire to harm God's people. It can get frustrating to me when I continue to hear that idolatry in the modern era is just something like love of money or spending too much time at work. Now, I don't think that those are good and healthy things. I don't think they're good, and I'm not saying they can't be forms of idolatry. Absolutely, but it's almost like idolatry in the proper sense of it has died off because we think, oh, well, they were after pagan gods, and we know that those gods aren't real. But I think through this study, we'll see that these are real beings. It's just that they're not God. They don't deserve worship like God does. They're created beings, and we shouldn't be going after them. But we don't almost know how to put idolatry in its proper spiritual context in this modern world. And so we kind of just water it down to being things that we're familiar with. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't evil beings that may influence us to do certain things like have an over love of money or to spend too much time at work or to love ourselves greater than our neighbor. Um, those could very well be the work of spiritual beings that are playing off of natural desires or um, things that are okay to do or like and just giving us a heightened love or appreciation of those things. That could still be idolatry. That could still be us elevating ourselves or creation over God. But I think we need to not separate it from the spiritual context that the Bible gives it, because then I think it, it kind of weakens it. Um, the origins of God's command to flee from idolatry, I think were based on an idea that there are supernatural beings that have rebelled against God and desire to harm us. 
These beings have a measure of power. And when we think of idols as nothing or the people that worship them as stupid, it kind of makes me feel like we've done exactly what evil spirit beings would want us to do by discounting them or pretending they're not real or shifting our focus away from them and this supernatural reality to something that's a little bit more physical, a little bit more concrete. And I think that's a mistake. I think we need to be very aware of our enemy. I think we need to be very aware of the tactics that they use. And I think we need to be more aware of the reality of the spiritual world. That's why we're doing this episode. So then how does this understanding of the spiritual realm interact with our understanding of spiritual beings? Do we have anything right? And I think we do. I'm not saying that we're totally wrong. Obviously, the terms angel and demon, they're not wrong. They're found in the Bible and they have their function. I would just say that we need to not limit it to those words and think that that encompasses the entirety of the spiritual realm. Now, some believe, and I think there may be some credence to this, that animals are actually after lesser spirit beings, kind of just as humans are after the God kind, animals might be after angel kind or... um, lesser spirit being kind, since we're not going to limit ourselves to just the term angel. And I think there there could be some truth to this in um, history as well. When you think about how many descriptions of angelic beings include animal attributes, I find this at the very least interesting. And when you see that a lot of the gods of ancient paganism are merged with animals, um, I find this at the very least interesting. Now, some explain this by saying that men have decided to worship creation instead of the creator. But if they are truly depictions of evil spiritual forces, I believe that evil spiritual forces interact with humankind. I don't believe that idolatry is as stupid as we make it out to be because I think these ancient pagan cultures interacted with evil beings that performed some sort of miraculous or powerful work. Um, And I think it was a counterfeit to true miracles or or truly God working, but I do believe that there was some sort of evidence that their worship did something, um, even though it was not God worship or it wasn't proper worship. So I think if you want to say that um, man has decided to worship creation, we're not wrong in that because these beings are still created. They are still a part of creation. So this statement is still true, just not in the way we've typically thought about it. It's not like some ancient person just decided that, oh, a tree is interesting and cool, so it must be worth worship. I think that they were actually interacting with spiritual beings that promised certain things or displayed certain measures of power and that people were led off after that because they either didn't know the true God or their temptations were exploited by these evil, malevolent beings. Um, To emphasize what we have right and what we need to expand our thinking on, though, I'd like to read an excerpt from BibleStudyTools.com. It says there are three main terms for demons in the New Testament. Daemonion, and that is translated demon 60 times, uh, 50 times being in the Gospels. Pneuma, meaning spirit, some 52 times usually with a qualifying adjective such as a catharton, which is unclean, or that's found 21 times, or poneron, which is translated evil, and that's eight times, but also translated demon, or rather used when a demonic presence is around, is the word angelos, or angel. This can be used for evil beings. One specific example is when Paul states that a messenger from Satan was sent to buffet him. The word for messenger there is angelos or angel. And this really fits because an angel um, in most of the context of the Bible is a messenger. So it's more of a role than a specific being. So I think you can keep the term angel because Often these spirit beings that are serving God are sent as angels or messengers. So I think it's totally fine to call them this. It's just that we cannot think of angel as a specific type of being that encompasses all of the spirit realm, uh, particularly on God's side. Now, additionally, there are times where God exercises power over unclean spirits, which kind of confuses things a little bit more. Like in the case of him sending an unclean spirit to Saul, And then in 1 Kings 22, a spirit from God's own counsel volunteers to be a lying spirit in the mouth of Ahab's prophets. Now, 
that is a really interesting one because it includes God's counsel, showing that there is a hierarchy of beings working for God, working with God. Um, and I think that kind of adds to this whole discussion as well. And you could say perhaps that it's God controlling evil spirits who have rebelled against him, or perhaps the wording and nature of the hierarchy of beings that have chosen to be subject to God is just different than we can really imagine, and that these are his servants doing what we don't really understand. Either way, the point is that things are far more complicated than saying angels and demons, and then thinking that we have a nice catch-all for everything spiritual. Because remember, from the beginning, I've said this, and I'll try and restate it here. I'm not trying to say that everything you believed about the spiritual realm is wrong and that I have the right view. I'm trying to say that statistically, we have looked at the spiritual realm through a very narrow lens and we need to broaden that lens and accept a more complex worldview. I'm not saying I have all the answers or all the delineations of all the beings and how they work and what their functions are and what they look like. The Bible doesn't offer that, but I think the Bible does support a more complex or intricate worldview um, based on the spiritual realm. So then for the next section, um, I'm going to lend myself hopefully a little bit of credibility by looking at what scholars have to say. And really who I'd like to introduce you to in terms of scholarship on the spiritual realm is Dr. Michael Heiser. I really wanted to have him on the podcast um, sometime early last year to discuss his worldview, but unfortunately he's been struggling with pancreatic cancer for the last year or so. And literally the day that we had the interview scheduled, he had to cancel due to some complications with his chemotherapy. And I was really disappointed, but still praying that he gets better and that maybe I can have him on sometime in the future. However, he is still the foremost Old Testament scholar uh, on this work of the spiritual realm. And I think even though some of what he says is a bit uncomfortable to the current understanding that Western minds have regarding the spirit world, I'm kind of a little bit tired of keeping his research under a basket, if you know what I mean. I always feel um, a certain hesitance to bring him up because I think people will start to think that maybe I'm a little bit insane um, because he's kind of doing concrete research on a topic that we often find abstract. So when you put concrete definitions or conclusions on a topic that we believe is only abstract, then you kind of start to seem a little bit crazy, even though his work is pretty strictly biblical. Um, now, I'm not saying that I agree with every single thing Dr. Heiser's ever postulated, but a lot of what he concludes, I can't find fault with. And I think at the very least, it broadens the view of the spiritual realm into a picture that is much more accurate to reality. And that's what we're trying to do today. Now, essentially, Dr. Heiser's worldview is one that states that there is basically a pantheon of lesser beings under the one true God. Now, we hear the word pantheon and we immediately freak out because we are monotheistic. We believe in one God. Um, so pantheon makes it seem like, oh, suddenly you're going into something that's not monotheistic, but that's not true. It's a pantheon as ancient paganism has viewed it. And that these, these gods can be recognized through human history and literature as little g gods. That's what he calls them. Um, particularly when they're in rebellion to the one true God. So at some point in time, these little g gods, along with Satan, their leader, rebelled and they looked to become worshipped themselves. Perhaps they had a measure of power from God. Perhaps they were um, tasked with ruling over the earth and reporting to God, not ruling in the sense that they're above God himself, but ruling on behalf of God, kind of like ambassadors. But then they sought to be worshipped themselves. They rebelled against him and they were allowed by God to seek people who would follow them. But then God took Israel, his own special people to himself to be a model to all nations and to um, enact salvation because eventually Jesus Christ would also come through Israel from the tribe of Judah. So this is backed up in Deuteronomy 32 verses 16 through 18. This is in uh, Moses' song. It says, they provoked him to jealousy with foreign gods. This is talking about ancient Israel. With abominations, they provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons, not to God, to gods they did not know, to new gods, new arrivals that your father did not fear. Of the rock who you begot, you are unmindful and have forgotten the God who fathered you. So the story of the Bible then becomes a story of God winning all people back to himself, by allowing people the choice to be freed from these malevolent beings and submitting themselves to him 
through Jesus Christ. Or they can go the way of those beings and die with them. And this is outlined in Psalm 82, verse 1 through 7. It says, God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. And that word there is Elohim, um, which oftentimes we take to just mean God the Father, Jesus Christ. But this word Elohim is often used for unclean spirits or um, when the medium at Endor raises up Samuel, quote unquote, from the dead, that thing is said to be an Elohim. So the word Elohim is a lot more broad, just like the the spiritual realm is a lot more broad. But here it's clearly not talking about um, God the Father or Jesus Christ, because it is God who stands in judgment amongst the gods, little g gods. Then verse two, how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Verse 3, defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Free them from the hand of the wicked. So at one point, uh, this is Dr. Heiser's worldview that I think is supported from this psalm and other parts in the Bible. These beings were meant to rule with God. They were granted a level of authority, but they ruled corruptly. They sought worship for themselves, and they stopped caring about the people of the earth. Then verse 5, it says, They do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are unstable. I said, you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. But you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. So some claim that this is talking about human men. But really, all men die like men. So this is unnecessary to say. Um, I think if it's Elohim that is being talked about, Like it was since the beginning of the psalm, it makes more sense that they would die like mere men um, in judgment from God. Now, a lot more can be said about this, but I I just don't have the time to defend it uh, as thoroughly as I'd like to, but it can be done. There are a lot more places in the Bible we could go to support this view. And I think it's also interesting, it says, fall like one of the princes. So we have the same imagery here as we have in Daniel 10 from the beginning of this episode. So this this hierarchy of beings, these princes or powers or principalities. And if you think about it, even this verse where Paul is talking about principalities and powers and rulers over the darkness of this age, even that speaks to kind of like a territorial authority or this hierarchical structure. And I think that's really interesting how all these pieces fit together. And this is why idolatry is such a big deal throughout the Bible and is a big deal today. This is why pagan nations were not meant to remain in Israel and why the worship of foreign gods was such a heinous and disgusting thing to God and why it was dangerous for his people to be a part of. This is why God threw down the idol when the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant and put it in the temple of Dagon. This is why the story of Elijah mocking the pagan gods is so incredible because these are real beings that have personalities and agendas and seek to actually destroy God's people or to harm them. This is why God says, you shall have no other gods before me because there are other lowercase g gods in existence around the world that are seeking worship for themselves. This is why every moment of Israel against paganism is full of imagery of spiritual warfare. And this is why the New Testament talks about the spirit realm like it's right here among us, warring over us all the time. I want to read a quote from Dr. Heiser in his book, The Unseen Realm. Um, And in this section, he's talking about Um, the part in Exodus where Moses is having this back and forth with Pharaoh and he's announcing the plagues over Egypt. And I think if we read this section with a supernatural worldview, we get a lot more out of it and we understand a lot more of what's going on and why this was not just a word battle, but a spiritual battle going on. So he says this, Pharaoh was the son of Re. That's an Egyptian god. Israel was explicitly called the son of Yahweh in the confrontation with Pharaoh. And he, he cites Exodus 4 verse 23 and Hosea 11 verse 1. Yahweh and his son would defeat the high god of Egypt and his son, God against God. That's big G versus little g. Son against son. Imager against imager. In that context, the plagues are spiritual warfare. Yahweh will undo the cosmic order, throwing the land into chaos. So go back and read that section with this worldview in your mind, this understanding that the spirit world is constantly acting. It's not just passive until the moment that 
that we decide to pray or the moment that we decide to sin. It is active and and always moving, furthering this agenda on either side, either for Satan's cause or for God's cause. Read these sections of the Bible again with this worldview and see how much more it comes alive. Because it's not just ancient people interacting with other ancient people. It is the spirit world interacting with the physical world. And this is what the Bible shows us if we look closely enough. It's not just what I'm speculating or what Dr. Heiser speculates or what other scholars speculate. It's just what the Bible outlines. And I think this is part of that stripping away our preconceived notions about what the spirit world looks like and taking our view of it in this simplistic form of it just being angels and demons, good versus evil, and rejecting that in favor of what the Bible actually tells us about the reality of the spiritual world. Now, I'd also like to point out as we wrap up here that none of this should change anything about your theology, and it also shouldn't be anything that makes you afraid. Um, It's a clearer look at something that is powerful, that is... um, kind of an enigma to us that is kind of unknown, but it shouldn't make us afraid because time and again, in all of these circumstances we've looked at today and in all of the circumstances where you'll begin to see the reality of the spiritual world uh, playing throughout the Bible, you'll see that God is in control of everything. He is over all things and all beings. He is the almighty God. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. He has all power and that never changes. What should change is your view on the spiritual world because it is real and it is serious. It's not just how ancient people looked at it with a more mythic mindset. This is the reality that the Bible draws out for us. And I think we lose it because we don't have a supernatural worldview. We don't really pay much attention to the supernatural outside of God and Satan, Um, but we should, and the Bible does. So I think it's something we need to pay attention to as well. It is literally warfare over you going on all the time. So it should cause you to take your life a little bit more seriously, your decisions a little bit more seriously. When that one spirit being says to Daniel, it's only me and Michael that are fighting. We should be able to say that we're going to help, that our decisions are going to be intentional, that what we do is going to be an active fight against evil spiritual warfare as well. And I also think this should offer a bit of depth and clarity Um, when we're reading the Bible. It's an instruction manual for how to live, absolutely. It's a collection of stories and examples, but it is also the greatest story ever told of God himself coming to dwell with mankind to release the hold of evil spirits over this world and then offer a way of salvation. Now, obviously, In the show Moon Knight, you had little g-gods of one pantheon fighting with each other. This was not a battle of good versus evil. Um, It was more like evil versus evil. But it was an incredible depiction of what this might look like just outside of the realm of human sight. Incredible, glorious beings created by God but on opposing sides of his will, whether they be in charge of geopolitical districts or whether they focus their attentions on certain temptations or certain people. I don't really know how it all works, but these beings are in a contest for you. And this is not something we should be afraid of because as it says in 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 3, the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. So I hope you found this interesting and you got a little bit of insight into the reality of the spirit world that we are interacting with every day, whether we realize it or not. I think it's better to, you know, have a clearer picture of what we're up against and who's fighting with us because really the power is not just on the evil side. The power is much more on the side of good and on the side of God. So I really hope that this causes you to read your Bibles with maybe some renewed excitement as well as a keener eye towards the reality of the spiritual realm and also the fact that reality is made up of spiritual and physical. It is not just this physical world that comprises reality, but also the spiritual aspect that we kind of get away from in this post-enlightenment period but that we need to get back into and we need to understand a little bit better. Maybe not in exactitude, but at least understand that it exists and that it is complex and it is diverse and that there are a lot of clues to that reality inside the Bible. Thanks very much again for listening through with me. I really do appreciate it. And until next time, keep on reading your Bibles, keep on thinking critically about them, and keep on applying the truths that we learn here to your lives. Thanks, everyone.